Good evening. I'm Yi Tiong Lim, Chairman of the Royal Institute of British Architect uh, Singapore Chapter. Thank you all for joining us this evening for the RIBA sharing session on the topic, the spaces of food. This event is in collaboration with the Urban Redevelopment Authority as part of the Singapore Heritage Festival. The RIBA Singapore Chapter was established in 2017. Similar to RIBA chapters globally, we are part of the efforts by RIBA to connect with its international members in this part of the world. Through activities by the Singapore Chapter, we hope to further our mission to advance architecture and education, to conduct knowledge exchange events such as this sharing session, to support and connect our members and the local community. The event this evening will be hosted by architect Ronald Lim with an esteemed panel of speakers, Dr. Lai Chi Kian, Mr. Kenneth Ho, Design Principal at Jerdy, Mr. Jason Wong, Director at Netatech. Ronald is an accomplished Singapore architect. He completed his Masters of Architecture from Yale University and worked internationally uh, for the likes of uh, Cesar Pelli and Fumihiko Maki before relocating back to Singapore working with Forum Architects and with Black Architects. He is currently the Chief Editor of the Singapore Architect Magazine and serves the RIBA Singapore Chapter as Honorary Treasurer. He teaches part-time at National University of Singapore and runs his own practice, Ronald Lim Architect. Now, to Ronald Lim, yep, who will be providing you background of this event's sharing session and introduction of speakers. Ronald. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to this sharing session on the spaces of food under the auspices of the Singapore Heritage Festival. Um, thank you for joining us from wherever you are. I'm sure you're, you're signing in from far and wide, uh, and we really appreciate your presence with us. Uh, before I start introducing this event and our panel of distinguished speakers, uh, I would like to extend my appreciation to the following delivery partners uh, for this event. Um, there is the National Heritage Board Singapore, the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Singapore, uh, particularly our colleagues Kelvin Ang and John Xiao of the Conservation Department, uh, and the International Division of the Royal Institute of British Architects, um, including our colleagues Aslina, Mithuna, Aldrin and Richard, and the RIBA Singapore chapter. And of course, thank you to our distinguished panelists for being with us. Food is an in integral part of our culture. Meal times involve more than just the cursory act of eating. They bring people together in a shared ritual where the sociable sharing of news is as much about human interaction that affirms our relationship as it is about the culinary delight of taste and smell. Food brings us together in powerful ways that create bonds, community and memories. This explains why in every city, the urban spaces that surround food, streetscapes or esplanades with lively restaurants and food stands, bustling market halls, or in Singapore's context, our ubiquitous hawker centres, are the very spaces where public life thrives. Food has a way of bringing people together within a community, livening up the public spaces that we inhabit to affirm our sense of belonging. There is also a different dimension to food. At the scale of the city, the spaces for producing, storing, and distributing food offer another perspective to understand our urban environment where food is part of an infrastructural flow and network with strategic implications for our city. The current technological reimagining of how food is produced, distributed and consumed will be consequential to our city's future. Here we have our 30 by 30 strategy that aims for us to produce 30% of our food's needs by 2030. So with this sharing session, we really hope to uncover the intricate links between food and our urban environment from the very perspectives of our distinguished panelists, uh, who include an architectural historian, an urban agriculture specialist, and an architect, roughly in that order. So let me introduce our distinguished speakers uh, right now. First off, we will have Do Dr. Lai Chi Kian, uh, who is the Vice President of the Society of Architectural and Urban Historians of Asia, Advisory Council member of the International Association for the Study of Traditional Environments. Uh, Lai Chi Kian is an uh, architectural and urban historian and a registered architect in Singapore. He's currently researching cooperative housing as an NLB Lee Kong Chien Research Fellow. He researches on histories of art, architecture, settlements, urbanism and landscapes in South Southeast Asia. 
and he's also by the by the uh, uh, the specialist on the history of modern architecture in Malaysia. There's no one who knows it more than him, right? Um, next up, as our second speaker, we have uh, Mr. Jason Wong, co-founder and director of sales at Netatech Engineering Private Limited. Jason officially trained by Netta Fim, which is the world's inventor of drip irrigation, is among the pioneers in revolutionizing Singapore Skyrise greenery. His strength lies in adapting and implementing precision irrigation and fertigation for green, green wall systems. Jason also expanded his portfolio to <coughs> rainwater harvesting and treatment and food production in urban environments to complement and integrate his expertise in water technologies. So I think we're going to learn a lot with Jason because not many people know much about this field. And um, last but not least, uh, we have Kenneth Ho, Senior Vice President, uh, Senior Design Principal at the architecture firm, The Jerdy Partnership. Kenneth is the current Senior Vice President and Senior Design Principal of The Jerdy Partnership. He has a passion for designing atypical community places and believes in finding creative ways to curate urban spaces. So um, I think we've got uh, we've got got very great perspectives here. Um, just one last note: um, as the presenters are speaking, I'm sure many of you will have burning questions. Please feel free to type them into um, the Q and A function, and we'll hopefully get to as many of them as possible during the Q and A session. So uh, without much further ado, I will hand the floor over to Chi Kian. Um, over to you, Chi Kian. Uh, thank you, Ronald. Uh... Thank you to RIBA, uh, URA and NHB for this uh, amazing event uh, and also to uh, I'd like to thank Richard right, who's uh, helping me with the slides. So uh, if we can have the first slide please uh, Richard, thank you. So uh, basically this uh, evening I'd like to uh, share with, uh, uh, with the panel and, and all of you uh, about this uh, exhibit that uh, is currently being uh, displayed at the Singapore Pavilion at the S Arsenale at the Venice Biennale. And uh, on, on, on the right hand side, you can kind of see a rough layout of the uh, exhibit on the left uh, to kind of complement the shape. Uh, this is a no hawking sign that uh, I was very fortunate to capture uh, along Buntat Street in Singapore. Uh, on uh, some shop houses which uh, also have been uh, demolished. So you can see this <clears throat> um, act of hawking, right? It's not only banned, you know, the, the no hawking signs are already uh, vanished uh, from uh, Singapore. Um, next slide, please, Richard. So what has happened in Singapore is uh, <clears throat> during the uh, colonial era, um, there were, you know, there was a, this, this, uh, uh, issue of uh, hawkers, right? on the one hand, they were in the city to uh, provide uh, inexpensive uh, food fare for the um, Asian workers uh, in the city. Uh, for example, at uh, around Raffles Square or you know, uh, around the Rocho, uh, <coughs> Rocho River area. Uh, these are some of the, the hawkers that you might have uh, seen right, if you were uh, back then. Um, and the different uh, locations that you, you can uh, find them. Uh, and these uh, created uh, two big uh, problems for um, the uh, colonial government who were also sort of uh, trying to um, limit their activity. Uh, and basically because uh, firstly, as you can see at the bottom left, uh, they would set up their stalls uh, along the streets uh, along the five foot ways uh, underneath the uh, shop houses and so would uh, congest uh, traffic. The second major reason was that uh, not all of the food was uh, hygienic and therefore led to uh, instances of cholera and uh, diphtheria and so forth, so on and so forth. But of course they provided uh, a great uh, function for the uh, general population uh, in, in Singapore uh, and at bottom right, you can see a uh, Wayang performance, right, uh, somewhere uh, near Keppel. And the hawkers that would also set up stalls uh, alongside the uh, traditional uh, Chinese theatre uh, scene. Uh, next, please. So to combat this uh, problem of uh, hawking, uh, the uh, colonial government set up uh, what were known as uh, hawker shelters. Uh, as early as uh, 1908. And one of the probable reasons why 
uh, the name changed from hawker shelters to hawker centers was, you know, ma mainly because of the uh, first uh, title that was given, uh, which was hawker shelters. So on the screen, you see uh, different types of uh, hawker shelters. The one on the left uh, was at Taman Sarasi, uh, built in a kind of a park setting with uh, open air as well as uh, shaded seats. Uh, on top right, uh, we see the Tangling Hall Food Centre, uh, which unfortunately will be going sometime in uh, August uh, this year. And these were uh, provided in the uh, housing estates. Okay. Um, at bottom uh, right, you, you see a sort of uh, much more recent version. This one is uh, in uh, Amokyo, somewhere central Singapore, where you can see a lot of um, uh, improvements over the 1970s model that was the uh, Tangling Hall Food Centre. Next, please. And uh, over time, there was about uh, 100 over uh, shop, uh, hawker centres that were, that were built over Singapore. Uh, this is the exhibit itself. Um, and, and because the different exhibits were uh, given a table to, to display or to make uh, displays, uh, I've decided to use uh, a stacks of melamine plates. These are the colorful circular uh, plates that you see uh, at the periphery. And then, of course, also each stack would have uh, information about a particular team right, that might be indicated on the label or on the tray. Uh, so so for, for this uh, evening, I uh, would like to just uh, talk a little about uh, space. Of course, that's what concerns us as uh, tropical architecture, perhaps perhaps, and uh, its function of uh, bringing people together, which is also the uh, team for Venice Binale uh, this year. Uh, next, please. So beginning with um, the different functions, I think a lot of us have used uh, the Hawker Centre Singapore, uh, but I think, you know, the evolution of the design has uh, has progressed uh, quite a bit since its uh, days, even after uh, uh, independence in Singapore in 1965. So as you can see, the, you know, you have uh, high ceilings, you know, you have uh, site lit uh, spaces, you know, air wells, uh, proper drainage, uh, grease traps, and so and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, services that uh, go into the uh, these these hawker centres, and uh, and they and they are, and they are improving uh, as well, right? So they are uh, forays into uh, cashless uh, payments and also sort of an automated uh, plate collection and so and so forth. Next, please. Uh, so, so there are four main uh, reasons why, you know, the, the hawker centers have sort of uh, transitioned from its original function to take hawkers off the street and to have a sort of a rather sanitized uh, location for food. And one of the uh, one of the first one, of course, is that uh, you will find, you know, a different kinds of uh, food in a hawker center, including uh, food from the other ethnicities. You know, Singapore being a, a multi ethnic society, and it is very likely that uh, any Singaporean uh, living through uh, his youth or, or in Singapore would likely to have encountered or and tasted. Uh, food from uh, another ethnic group uh, uh, at the hawker center itself because of the uh, free choice available uh, for the food. And uh, speaking of varieties, uh, what you see on the screen are all sort of a noodle dishes. Uh, and you can see that uh, different uh, groups right, have uh, embraced uh, and experimented with different forms of uh, cooking uh, noodles and, and also different types of noodles. Next, please, Richard. Uh, the second uh, major reason, of course, is that uh, it also catered to sort of the, the sort of idiosyncrasies of life that uh, you experience in Singapore. So, for example, uh, the takeaway culture, which is proving quite important now during the uh, COVID-19 uh, situation. Uh, and then, of course, you know, quirks, you know, for people to uh, reserve seats. Uh, and you know, at the uh, middle row on the right, you you know, there's there are even sort of uh, 
holes drilled into the tables for you know umbrellas and uh, walking streets, uh, and of course there, there you know there will be accessibility issues, and uh, you know uh, and and also sort of a deities right would also find their place uh, in the in the food centers. The next piece. The third reason is of course that is uh, mainly that the uh, hawker center right has uh, sort of become a, a space of uh, transmitting information as well right uh, beginning in 1979 with uh, two uh, government campaigns the first one was to encourage uh, hawkers to speak uh, Mandarin in 1979 uh, and the sort of a uh, courtesy campaign right so these uh, very early campaigns uh, eventually evolved to uh, aspects that were sort of a more uh, serious so for example uh, during the uh, SARS uh, pandemic, right, uh, it became a sort of information center where uh, folks can learn about what to do and what not to do. Uh, and of course, you know, uh, other campaigns to uh, minimize food waste, uh, you know, uh, being able to sort of uh, conduct um, a, a healthy lifestyle through food and also, you know, the current uh, campaign to uh, indict uh, hawker culture as uh, as heritage right? as well as uh, as a uh, global heritage next please and then uh, finally also it's because the uh, it has uh, hawker food it, itself right has uh, sort of uh, gained uh, popularity right not just uh, among the uh, locals uh, but through their introduction in uh, in, in in such a books uh, and uh, sort of a, they they have become and and also making it to the uh, Michelin guide right uh, these these uh, accolades you know suggestions and ratings have also created uh, uh, you know uh, the sort of a popularity of uh, coming to food and therefore you also see you know uh, hawker centers becoming uh, a tourist attraction. And some of the tourists would, in fact, just go to the uh, certain hawker centers to, to try out certain uh, famous foods uh, and even sort of a food critics and uh, globally known food critics would also come here. So in, in this short uh, presentation, uh, I'd like to uh, talk about the uh, exhibit, but also the uh, change of uh, functions of the hawker centers over the years from a seemingly sort of a draconian uh, method of getting hawkers off the streets, you know, creating a, a sanitary uh, environment to its uh, closer sort of um, communal functions and uh, multi-ethnic uh, dispersion of foods across uh, the different uh, ethnic groups in Singapore. Right, thank you very much. Okay, okay. hi, hi everyone. Uh, thanks, Chicken. Okay, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Jason Wong and I'm the uh, co-founder of Netata Engineering. Today I'll be sharing with you some of the uh, urban farms uh, that we have been building in Singapore. But before I do that, I would like to shift your attention towards uh, some of the reasons why we started building urban farms in this island for the past seven years. So uh, the first reason that drove us towards this direction was actually the food production impact that we are seeing uh, happening globally. Um, there are actually two uh, uh, segments that pose a threat uh, primarily to open field agriculture. Uh, and this is uh, challenged by erratic climate conditions such as rising global sea levels, high global temperatures, uh, extreme climate conditions and the change of weather patterns. So that uh, poses a hindrance in the uh, farming process. On the other side, we have the geopolitical tensions. Yeah, um, there's also a shortage of food supplies, which is currently happening in China. Um, there are also hoarding of food supplies, uh, and we have seen sudden disruptions in food supplies, especially during the uh, the pandemic lockdowns. Uh, but that was temporal, but but it's already a, a signal to tell us that um, that is quite uh, critical uh, in times of crisis. Um, the other uh, item uh, that drove us into farming is that uh, because of the Singapore food security narratives, um, <clears throat> as you 
uh, know Singapore is a, a, a tiny little island uh, that is highly dependent on the importation of food. So 90% of our food supply comes from neighboring countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, and so forth. Um, and there's also food safety concerns. Uh, there's in the neighboring countries, they, they are probably poor farming capability and know-how, as well as lack of funds that may uh, result in unsafe farming methods, uh, including the heavy use of pesticides. Uh, we are also subjected to food prices fluctuations uh, in times of uh, erratic climate conditions or maybe during uh, geopolitical tensions. And the one of the, the, the big problem was that the previous generation of farmers in Singapore is uh, decreasing significantly. And at the same time, our consumption rate is going higher by the day. So um, that all of that basically hinders uh, our food security in Singapore. So um, we reckon that automation is probably the key to building a successful uh, 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 sustaining uh, a farm in Singapore. That leads us to the uh, Singapore's 30 by 30. Um, we, uh, it, as a nation, we are targeting to produce at least 30% of the nation's consumption uh, by 2030. And uh, NetaTech is part of this movement. Um, this could be done, okay, through deploying uh, high-tech farms uh, using sustainable farming practices and renewable energy throughout its growing process. Uh, it also enables us to create jobs uh, because of the, uh, the, the disappearing uh, uh, farming industry. We are trying to uh, uh, initiate back this workforce of agronomists, engineers, as well as uh, farm operators. This is a food nexus uh, that closes the food, water, and waste loop of Singapore. Uh, as you know, um, Singapore has a long history in solving its importation of water problem uh, in the past, where we take water from Malaysia. And uh, over the decade, we have become self-sustaining as a nation uh, to sustain ourselves of water. Uh, through the efforts, by the efforts, sorry, by the efforts of Public Utility Board, the PUB, hence uh, uh, the success of our water story. Uh, likewise, uh, on, the, on the next agenda is the food story. So we are facing a similar conundrum whereby um, the food sources are coming from the same neighboring countries. So we are trying to uh, 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 set up this uh, self-sustaining food movement by uh, growing our own food and uh, educating the next generation uh, to, to, to grow uh, sustainable and clean, clean food. And then uh, lastly would be to tackle the waste portion by uh, recycling our food waste and then um, put it to good use. Uh, one of the uh, Example would, would be to decompose some of these food waste using black soldier flies. And through the process, we are able to produce natural frass as a source of ingredient for fertilizer. So that way, uh, we are able to uh, close the, uh, the food and water loop. So um, based on these critical factors that I've shared with you all, um, we have developed a solution that could solve a portion of the Singapore's food security issue. And that is how we came about um, developing the vertical food stage. Okay. Um, okay, so Netatech has developed this vertical uh, a farm. We call it the vertical food stage, right? And uh, we developed this uh, prototype uh, as a joint effort together with the Tomase Eco Sparity Foundation and the Tampanese Town Council. So this vertical farm basically uh, was launched on the 5th of December 2020 uh, with the conjunction uh, with the Tampanese Park Sustainability Event. 
uh, and is located at the HDB block, Tampines Avenue 5. So the concept of this design is basically to have a modular farming system that could utilize the abundant unused vertical spaces in Singapore, uh, where it's quick to easy, uh, quick and easy to erect. Uh, it's lightweight and it's accessible to the residents in the heartlands of Singapore. Um, this vertical food stage is also fitted together with solar panels for powering the irrigation controllers, the pump systems, uh, the grow lights, and it is also come together with a rain harvesting system for the irrigation purposes. The vertical food stage is also a, um, a farm where it is uh, we develop it close to having zero energy consumption throughout the food production cycle. And that is to uh, tap into all these renewable sources that is widely available uh, to us uh, based on the climate condition of Singapore. So Singapore, we have a lot of sun and we have a lot, lot of rain. So we basically can harvest all this energy and then use it for our growing process. And uh, at the same time, because the vertical farm is located right at the residential area, we are able to eliminate the carbon footprint needed when it comes to uh, transporting and uh, the logistics of the vegetables. Hence, all this will eventually contribute to lowering the dollars and cents that the people need to uh, fork out for buying vegetables. So that's the that's the one of the main main intent. Uh, ideally, the, the, the setup of this vertical food stage is actually to install them at these uh, housing development boards, apartment blocks uh, at the uh, uh, gable west facing end walls where we can capture most of the of the day's sunlight. Yeah, uh, uh, for photosynthesis purposes. Just like a greenhouse, um, the VFS is enclosed with a crop protection membrane so that it protects itself from pests. And uh, it can also incorporate a packing coal room and a storage facility below. All right, so that the moment we harvest the vegetables, it can be packed immediately and then delivered to the residents uh, uh, and, the, and the owners of the block. These are some of the vegetables that we are growing uh, for the community. Uh, these are the staple uh, uh, crops uh, that is mainly on the uh, table uh, of our locals. And uh, we are also, it's possible that we can grow uh, high protein rich mushrooms uh, along with it. And this is the actual uh, prototype of the vertical food stage. Uh, this is the uh, this was launched uh, in December, and as you can see, um, it basically has a structure that protects itself from the uh, from the past. Uh, this can will eventually be improved over time. Um, the, the, the vertical food stage is actually equipped with uh, weather stations, uh, humidity and UV radiation sensors, uh, <clears throat> because we get to gather all this necessary data for crop modeling and yield prediction in the future. And uh, we have a, a, a controller that actually captures all this data to understand the behavior uh, of the VFS and uh, we are able to identify like in, in, in the portions of the vertical food stage on the higher portion, we have more sunlight and then on the lower tier, we have lesser sunlight. How do we uh, balance off uh, 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 the distribution in that sense? And also to maybe we could also allocate different types of crop grown on different tiering based on the on the condition of the or the requirement of the species. Uh, the project was this prototype was actually launched together with the uh, GRC ministers on that day, and uh, yeah. So the target and yield uh, of our our projection is that 
there's actually 2 million unused, 2 million square meters of unused vertical space in Singapore. So uh, the VFS is actually designed to assist uh, the, the, the issues of land scarcity of growing vegetables. Uh, if they are fitted throughout all the HDB blocks, uh, according to our estimate, it can produce up to 75% of vegetables consumed by the entire population. Uh, typically, they, the, the consumption per household is about 5 to 6 kgs of vegetables a month, uh, and equi equivalent to 2 square meters of vertical food production spaces. So the, the VFS basically enables us to be price competitive in that sense because we take away all the cost of food production through the use of renewable energy as well as uh, locating it uh, near the residential areas. So if you can see on this chart here, um, we actually able to pro uh, position the, 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 the production, the cost of production from the vertical food stage at one dollar and ninety five cents per two hundred grams, whereas um, on the other indoor farms, uh, they cost a little bit more because they use a uh, uh, heavy usage of uh, UV lights. So the, the, the cost of electricity goes up as well as uh, artificial ventilations within the, the, the farms. So all this adds up to the to the cost of the vegetables. This is how the uh, future of the vertical food stage we anticipate it to be. Uh, this is a uh, artist's impression of uh, how we hoped that the vertical food stage would look like in the future when it's cladded into some of these apartment buildings, uh, basically to give the, the mundane design of the HDB blocks a little bit of flavor and futuristic design. Uh, at the same time, we want to uh, continue to, to, to improve the VFS to reduce uh, heat within the, the structure, uh, increase the stack ventilation, and uh, 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 increase the UV penetration. Yeah. So this, this uh, artistic impression is basically a, a, a production of a professor come architect at the Singapore University of Technology and Design. Uh, Dr. Carlos. So just a little bit of an introduction to the uh, Netatech engineering team. We have a, uh, a series of uh, personnel in the company uh, focused primarily on water and food. Uh, that's myself as a sales director and we have a lead agronomist who has been um, working on all the uh, farm sciences to help us increase the yield uh, of our produce. Uh, as well as the uh, the consultant of farm technology, yeah. This is the Netatech Nexus. So basically, uh, as a company, we have three divisions. One is to handle the uh, 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 big data management and the control system through cloud-based and uh, predictive modeling. On the farm side, we build uh, high-tech greenhouses, vertical farms, and uh, open field irrigation, and. The core of the business is mainly on the urban drip irrigation, where we help our clients to uh, save water uh, through the landscape irrigation and rainwater harvesting. Uh, so basically, this is what we do in, in, in Netata Engineering uh, by closing the water loop, uh, irrigating the, the green roofs and the green walls, uh, stormwater management, um, yeah, and uh, uh, rain harvesting systems. So yeah. Basically, what we do is we, we compress all our experience, our 12, sorry, our 13 years of experience into the farm by applying a drip irrigation, precise drip irrigation to conserve water in the farms. Uh, we have built green roofs and green walls. Uh, on the top right corner, you can see there are nine uh, green walls that we uh, researched together with the national parks to see the viability. Uh, of each of the green walls in terms of uh, thermal mitigation, water consumption, and, and sound soundproofing. Uh, on the center, you can see the mural of green wall. This is a, a green green wall that we uh, work together with the world-renowned artist called Patrick Blanc. Uh, it's on the sixth battery road of Singapore. Uh, this is uh, a green wall that is irrigated by us using rainwater 
system and our drip irrigation. And on the bottom is the green roof of uh, Universal Studios that we, 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 we deploy. And of course, we are very uh, heavily involved in rainwater harvesting systems uh, using UV disinfection, uh, ultrafiltration, uh, that sort of stuff for our clients, uh, such as the property developers, Micron Technology, HTB, JTC. Uh, it's just an exorbitant amount of uh, clients. So uh, our track record basically share with you more. Uh, we have built an urban farm uh, in the northwest of the island. Uh, this is a farm, a high-tech farm that uh, we use to grow our vegetables to supply to cold storage and uh, red mud. The, the farm basically uses a state-of-the-art fertigation system so that uh, it delivers precise fertilizer uh, to increase the yield of the, the vegetables that we grow. We also deployed the, uh, the drip irrigation uh, as well as this farm uh, harvests its own uh, discharge, water discharge back into the tanks, recycle them and then pump them back out for, for, for irrigating the crops again. Okay, so this, this has a weather station attached to it uh, together with uh, automatic shading to whenever the, 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 the weather station detects a high radiation in the, in, the, in, the, in the structure, it closes the shade. So yeah, this is one of the most advanced uh, uh, greenhouses we have installed. Secondly is the Funan Redevelopment Mall. Uh, this is a shopping mall that has three farm structures on level seven in Singapore, right? You can see uh, just the three st structures on the uh, mid, mid part of the photographs. Let me show you a clearer picture here. Yeah, so you can see there are three farm structures here that we uh, jointly developed with uh, Grant Associates, the, uh, the architects that design uh, gardens by the bay. So each of these farm structures basically are equipped with solar panels as well, uh, and each of them grow uh, different uh, types of vegetables, microgreens, uh, mushrooms, uh, mm -hmm. and one of the structures is basically uh, an aquaculture system in place. So you can see uh, some of these farms on uh, as it's cascading, each of these locations are growing a different type of uh, 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 vegetable species. All right, so farm A is aquaculture, farm B is a mushroom, and then farm C is sprout and microgreens. You can see here a cut section of the, uh, the, the farm structure that is growing uh, mushrooms. Uh, we kept the, the, uh, the structure dark and uh, through uh, using uh, Hello, Jason. Yeah. Uh, Jason, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I think uh, we're we're a little past time. Okay. Uh, so maybe you could like wrap it up really quickly. Yeah. I think this. Uh, yeah. Okay. Thanks a lot. So just the last one here is the uh, the the greenhouse mini greenhouse that we installed for one of our clients. Basically, it's uh, it's a CSR program where the client just um, uh, realized that there's unutilized space on their tennis courts, so they turn it into a, a farm production a, a food production center. So yeah. Okay, I can probably end my presentation right here. I'm sorry for the delay. Okay. So um, as of now, I'll hand it over to uh, Ken. Thank you. All right. Give me one second while I try to bring up the screen. So I'm um, going to try to do this in that a lot of 10 minutes or do I have to uh, go faster than that? <laughs> um, as fast as you wish to. Yeah, I guess we just have to make do with We'll just compress the Q&A accordingly. All right, let me try to show my screen uh okay good evening and good day to everybody who's uh, on this call uh thank you for uh, i was invited by a, a um an riba member to uh kind of share our experience uh, at the jody partnership um on our opinion on this topic through some of the projects we've done so it's sort of a international uh, uh take on uh, a lot of the top, uh, the 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 issues that um, my esteemed fellow guests uh, speakers have brought up. 
in the prior slides. So uh, pretty quickly, uh, this this presentation I'm going to try to do uh, break up into three sections. The first one sort of identifies uh, cultural conditions. Um, a lot of the, the, the issues of, of uh, planning that happens with, with thinking about spaces for food. Um, and so these cultural conditions are, are things we encounter with all the projects we uh, 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 come across through the different regions. Um, and then the second section would go into sort of a survey of the urban spaces that we've we've um, encountered and and been inspired by and and sort of uh, learned from in, in uh, incorporating into our projects. Uh, you could call it a five foot walkway in Singapore to laneways in Melbourne to Yokocho's uh, food alleys in in Japan um, and. Uh, uh, where our office is based in uh, the the ideas of food trucks, and then the last few uh, section would try to show a couple of the projects. We'll probably condense this portion for tonight. All right. Uh, brief introduction to our firm for those who are not quite aware. Um, the Jody Partnership was started in 1977 by John Jody. Um, you'll see some of the projects that may be uh, familiar to some of us. Uh, the Universal City Walk and the uh, top portion and uh, Universal Studios Los Angeles uh, and below the Bellagio uh, in, in Las Vegas. So the common thread as the, the firm had has evolved from um, mixed use development. Uh, I think there's a heritage of uh, entertainment in it. So food and, and um, community building where th there's a lot of focus you'll see in our projects as we've encountered to always uh, uh, find ways of creating gathering spaces for people and what better way than food. Great, so here's a, just a quick brief uh, uh, survey of the ethnography or, or, or uh, some of the issues that we encounter with some of the projects uh, in relation to the food spaces. So just quick beautiful graphics by others. Um, this is an artist, Henry Hargreaves and Caitlin Levin. Levine, who um, basically sort of portrays each country through the foods that uh, is most inherent in them. Uh, and you'll see corn for the United States to the left, uh, noodles for China to the right, uh, seaweed for Japan below, tomatoes for Italy. So it would be interesting to see a take for what Singapore would be uh, with uh, our great uh, mixture that uh, Dr. Lai Chi Kian had, had mentioned earlier. Uh, there's an innate interest in us in, in, in all what we do to understand the places where we're in and uh, maps are a great way for that. Uh, um, the map to the left is, is, is labeled, uh, if I could zoom in, not by the, the, the name of the stop, but actually by bars that you could find. So um, somebody who's uh, really looking for a drink at 3 a.m. in New York City would use the map on the left uh, a lot more than they would use the regular map. Um, and then in our version, um, Food Panda has a version which I suppose uh, could be more uh, focused in, in, in how, how uh, diverse our food culture is. Uh, this is a quick map uh, diagram identifying the grading of hawker centers in that sense in Singapore. Um, so we found it kind of interesting to see how uh, the distribution of the hawker centers um, are in in our whole country. So you'll see this uh, spatial contour of the hawker centers uh, and, a, and, a, and a density and distribution for this island. So another of the, uh, the main things that are recurring themes that uh, are slowly uh, either proposed by um, the client to us or, uh, or you know, as we're trying to propose to them, uh, some of the issues starting from farm to table and how uh, some a lot of the planning of cities, uh, there's a project by uh, Regen Village by Effect uh, Architects, uh, trying to describe that entire uh, loop that um, Jason had mentioned. Uh, and so 
as we encounter projects in Vietnam and, and more of the cities uh, out here, a lot of the future urban planning projects, uh, these issues come out of, about how to create a closed loop sort of uh, planning so that waste and uh, food production are within um, all the considerations. Right, um, holler if, if um, the slides are not moving or anything, but right, at a five minute mark, here we go. Um, and, and then so essentially that diagram for that previous village uh, where storage and, and production all close around to, to uh, um, make it zero emissions and, and uh, zero waste. And of course, uh, uh, Singapore's own URA, uh, I mean JTC's master plan for Sungai Kadut wants to uh, encompass a lot of that with the vertical farms within the, the project. So um, um, those are just a lot of issues that we've encountered. Uh, and so now just a brief survey of um, the urban spaces that we find, uh, I'm sure, uh, our, our firm, uh, as is always um, categorizes as, as a practice that does placemaking. So these are some of uh, the spaces that inspire the placemaking strategies that we've employed. Uh, so from the Melbourne laneways, uh, you know, the scale of those spaces to the Yokocho alleyways of uh, Japan, to the, um, the traditional urban fabric of, uh, of Shanghai and Tianzufang. Um, uh, all of these food centric places. And in this case, uh, you know, our base headquarters city of Los Angeles, because it's a horizontal city uh, and and greatly defined by a lot of the freeways, uh, it actually has the most food trucks in, in the entire United States at 591 food trucks. Um, and uh, it is then a defining feature of, for its urban fabric. And so that brings up another condition where, uh, you know, uh, the notion of transitory program from libraries to, to uh, um, uh, nurseries um, to airstreams with uh, entertainment in it um, can travel through your city. Uh, and of course, marketplaces in all its different forms and different cultures, whether it be in a souk uh, for projects we've done in Middle East to floating uh, markets to the aquatic addiction um, development in Taiwan. And the next space uh, urbanistically would be rooftop gardens uh, as identified, but in this case, uh, bars, rooftop bars that are also part of that. Uh, not not at a, not at the uh, the city level, but more at like uh, um, the individual um, operators from these restaurants who then have their own farms uh, in their bars. So just a quick overview of uh, some of the projects uh, we have done. Uh, pretty good, we have one and a half minutes. Uh, I think uh, Rapongi Hills is, is um, some of, uh, may be aware of this project. Um, it is in Tokyo. Uh, this project, you'll see an image of, this is the West Loop. Uh, it's basically an exploratory uh, way of getting down from the um, observation, uh, sorry, the um, uh, community deck and on the third floor, and it comes down, it gives you a winding um, switchback path to come down to this garden, which is historically a, a samurai garden, an Edo garden. But what's more interesting to share with you uh, is actually the rooftop of uh, this project completed in 2000. Seven, I believe, two thousand three. Uh, anyway, um, you will see the top right. Uh, two images on the top right. Uh, essentially, the roof of the theaters, and the the west loop. The earlier image was um, to the right of that. But programmatically, the Mori company in uh, Tokyo 
they run a program where uh, the families come together every uh, um, year to have this rice patty um, planting uh, plant uh, plantation. Uh, sorry, let's go back. Um, uh, festival up there, so you know that the kids can get the experience of of uh, actually creating your own food with planting rice. Right in the middle of a very dense urban development. Uh, here's another project that was just completed about last year uh, in the city of Kawagoe. Kawagoe is a city uh, that is about 45 minutes by train north of Tokyo. Tokyo is otherwise known as Edo, and this is known as Little e, uh, Tokyo, so it's Ko Koedo. Um, and this is the subway station that uh, you see on the right side. And the project that we had, um, you see this, this, I don't see the mouse moving around, but the intent was to have, uh, it's actually a project for the, the local government's uh, city office that uh, combines mixed use uh, retail two levels on the first le uh, at the ground level, civic offices for the next five levels and a hotel for the, for the Tokyo Olympics actually, uh, because this city will be used for all the golf uh, uh, competitions because um, it has the most golf courses. So you'll see this this intent. Uh, this is the project itself um, as it arrives from the from the, um, the the train station from the front, but the the back is actually where you see that Koedo sign to the bottom right. Uh, urbanistically, this idea of then continuing that Yokocho uh, scale from the rest of the city right through the project uh, at the back and it continues down towards the city's uh, um, civic auditorium. Uh, another project in uh, um, Hengchen next to Macau, you'll see the Kotai strip uh, to the top of the uh, image. Um, and um, as the Kotai strip comes over, you will go through an immigration building to the um, city of Zhuhai in, in China. So this immigration building is right, that big rectangular building that you see, and our project is a gateway building to the right of it. Um, and the intent of this building was to create all the F&B destinations uh, at the rooftop so that they would get the view back towards the Kotai Strip. Um, so at the center of that, uh, development was uh, envisioned to be this tree house bar in a sense where circulation uh, is organized around it and so people arrive from that immigration building go up the stairs my bad and then swing back around uh, getting up to the rooftops uh, garden of this car. Uh, next project is in Seoul uh, this is the D-Cube city in Seoul. The client actually requested a, an Italian uh, hill climb for the F&B uh, tenants on the front of the project. Um, and then we sort of uh, convinced them to go with more of a contemporary uh, language, but achieve the exact same intent of rooftop terraces for dining, um, and each one of those pavilions was, is, is sort of um, created as, 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 as a, pav uh, a lantern along the street uh, that leads towards the uh, downtown Seoul uh, on the street to your right. Uh, and then some of the projects that we've done in, uh, in the South Pacific, in Australia, this is Brisbane, where we're the placemaking consultants for the Queen's Wharf uh, IRD. Uh, uh, in Brisbane. So this is the River Bend, um, and the project uh, is proposing an IRD that sits on top of a lot of existing uh, uh, local heritage buildings. A lot of the laneways we talked about earlier uh, was how the intent was then, how do we bring some of that smaller scale laneways uh, into the larger scale of uh, this large civic spaces for the IR. So the entire base of the IR was uh, conceived as a series of steps that are given back to the city as, you know, 
farmers markets, um, places for people to gather through all these different steps um, that are. Um, Ken, would I be able to um, interrupt you here for us to carry on this exciting conversation as a group uh, with each other? I think we're running out of time. Um, I have reached the end. That is it. Oh, oh, I'm sorry to disturb you. <laughs> That's it. OK, wow. Um, thank you, everybody. Um, it's it's really um, I, I think, Ken, your, your presentation was actually perfect in how you closed up um, the loop uh, between some of the social and cultural aspects of um, sort of uh, hawker culture, as well as sort of the more uh, environmental, climatic or food resilience aspect that was uh, in Jason's uh, presentation as well, um, which I think it's uh, it's kind of like very fascinating in a way. And you, you kind of look at it from a pretty interesting standpoint. But maybe let's let's return back to Chi Kian for a while. Um, Chi, Kian, uh, Chi Kian, I'm very interested uh, in, since you took a very historical approach in really researching the history of the uh, Hawker Center, whether you could maybe share with us some of your personal discoveries or takeaways uh, when researching about the history of um, the Hawker Center. I'm especially interested in what you have to say about the unique um, cultural and social dimensions of a, a Hawker Center. I believe you mentioned political campaigns, social campaigns, you know, as a space for messaging, um, stuff like that. Oh, it seems like we, Chicken, you. He's on mute. Oh, Chicken, Chicken, you're, you're on mute. Okay, maybe maybe I'll have my next question over to Kenneth uh, then. Uh, maybe Kenneth, um, taking uh, taking your presentation, um, talking about things like um, curating urban spaces, social connectivity and placemaking to uh, lane ways, um, I'm, I just want to gather um, a bit of your response to Chi Kian's presentation. Well, let's just start on, focus a bit more on the social um, aspects of, uh, aspect of spaces right now yeah i, I think uh chicken's uh, uh um uh survey of the the uh the heritage of uh, our culture you know um, if anybody's seen the netflix uh, mm -hmm. uh segment on on our singapore um food uh i think a the, there's the description that the true because we're an immigrant culture um you know made of of, of uh, immigrants we mm -hmm. yeah um the, the true one thing that really ties us together is food. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I think it's one of, our, uh, as identified by UNESCO, you know, it's one of mm -hmm. our great defining um, urban features that, that is our true urban living living room. Mm -hmm. It's where people gather. Unfortunately, sometimes it's a line that's 45 minutes long to get roasted up, but yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking more in terms of how um, not just about the fact that we eat um, in these spaces, but the fact that uh, it becomes its own thing, right? Um, the fact that politicians have to go there, uh, go there during an election campaign or the fact that the first space uh, that property agent who wants to sort of recruit you, uh, you know, uh, for uh, I wouldn't say recruit you, but to sell property and to gain awareness would be to go to the Hawker Center, uh, which is where people gather. I was wondering whether this uh, programmatic aspect of uh, Hawker Center could really help us um, arrive at newer um, types of informal spaces. I, I think uh, for, for someone like yourself coming from the background of retail planning, um, and I'll take a shot at, at, at the part of the question that was asked. I, I, I still think that, uh, you know, where you, you meet people, uh, um, the opportunity to meet all the different uh, 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 segments of the community. Um, it, to us, I think the, the, the Hawker Center, if anything, um, uh, there's a, the other project that we were actually somewhat involved in was the redevelopment. Uh, I mean, it was started off with it was Holland Village. It was envisioning how the market at Holland Village uh, would then expand out to the new development of a residential behind it. Uh, and, and, and so it's the same notion where the public spaces that we've planned uh, throughout the world, it, it, it really is 
creating these spaces that I think in the future, if you look at the, um, uh, there's, a, there's a project right now that's being planned in Australia for a seafood market. I think some of the ideas that, that Jason brought up, if our hawker centers can develop into things that, um, you know, and some of the communal spaces that the food trucks have in, 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 um, in Los Angeles, I think a lot of all these ideas, if they cross pollinate, they would sort of affect the way we, we would then portray our hawker centers so that they, they evolve to even more of a, a place where people gather. Yeah, and, and, and things that to that question, uh, to, to that response, Ken, um, there is a question, in fact, from, you know, the audience. And I think that you know, the, the, the question would, in fact, um, uh, 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 would be, in fact, a, a good one for all three of you to respond in the sense that, you know, what effect, you know, has COVID had on these hawker centers currently? Um, and the things I was thinking of expanding on the audience's question as in, besides, you know, hawker centers, you know, what effect does it have on, you know, um, the start of the food chain? And the things that, of course, you know, where uh, the hawker center uh, is, and of course, you know, and, and, and how does the, you know, COVID survive sort of have impact on maybe cultural or social or behavioral sort of like um, aspects uh, of the hawker center? So maybe just starting with Jason, um, yeah, okay, so the only effect that we saw in terms of the food supplies in Singapore, because we have uh, about 30 greenhouses located in Chiang Mai, so uh, on regular basis, we, we, we fly the vegetables in uh, from, from that location, but when the, when the pandemic happened and all the countries had to shut down, we saw a disruption on our supply because the, the the borders were locked down by the by the government and no no food can come out from Thailand, so that kind of like creates this whole paranoia uh, within the government within the the, the the company and the government as well. So right now the the the, the direction is to try to build as much uh, vertical farms in Singapore if possible so that we do not uh, encounter some of these uh, disruptions uh, mm -hmm. in our food supply, yeah. Yeah, yeah that, and, and the things that, let's just say, you know, with the initiative that you have on the vertical, so like farming, you know, does this so like current COVID so like accelerate your, uh, uh, your business in terms of bringing things like, like years ahead? Um, as of now, we, they, they, they have been uh, talks uh, between um, Tamase as well as uh, the, the Eco Fund. Um, we are trying to uh, gather some of these uh, grants to deploy more of these vertical farms across uh, different GRCs, such as the East Coast and Tampines. But all of that being said is in the midst of works. It did gather a lot a lot of attention and uh, we, 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 we're getting um, consistent uh, uh, emails and, and, and uh, meetings with uh, SFA and all the other government related agencies to see how we can um, uh, speed up this process. Um, but as of now, we, the, 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 our prototype just got deployed in the 5th of December. So uh, we are still uh, um, trying to figure out how we can go about rolling out the, the next phase of six to seven more uh, vertical farms in uh, these uh, HDB districts. Yeah, and, and back on to this, uh, the, you know, the core question of, of if there is any sort of like effect like COVID had on these hawker centers currently, um, Chikian, wondering if you've got any insight to that. Sorry, everyone. Uh, I was uh, te Microsoft teamed out just now. Uh, thanks, thanks for the question, uh, uh, Tiong. Uh, yes, definitely. I think uh, one of the things that we probably have to notice is that, uh, you know, very often when we talk about tropical architecture, we think about, you know, those uh, resort hotels and all that. But uh, because of the services and the way that the, uh, the hawker centers have been built, right, uh, 
you get ventilation, you know, uh, and uh, additional mechanical ventilation. So, so when when COVID came, uh, the only sort of restriction that uh, came into place was, uh, you know, the distancing and you know the sort of uh, take away food and so on and so forth. So it was able to sort of adapt and uh, was able to sort of still uh, provide food. The only problem was, you know, the sort of electronic connect communication, uh, you know, uh, that, that is put up on, on websites, you know, and uh, sort of online uh, uh, delivery services. So so you can we can see the Hawker Center sort of evolving. And uh, just like in SARS, uh, there was a lot of attempts to try to um, tr try to uh, use this as a sort of a public communications point, right? Uh, earlier on, there was already sort of a uh, sanitation measures in place, right? You have all these uh, uh, cleanliness ratings, right? A, B, C, D, you know, although, you know, the C doesn't mean the food is not good. Uh, mm -hmm. And then you, you have all these sort of uh, different campaigns. So you, you can say that it's kind of a surveillance space, but, you know, by, by keeping it clean, by keeping it rodent free, by keeping it uh, as really sort of a working tropical architecture, it has sort of uh, uh, done well, right, in, in uh, pro still providing um, a, a place for food uh, during the COVID pandemic. Right, and, and with all these benefits, do you think uh, besides Lao Pasat that has been, you know, conserved, do you think that there will be other hawker centres in Singapore that will be conserved? Uh, there are three phases, right? Uh, the colonial ones uh, from uh, 1908 to 1950. And then from 1950 onwards, you know, there was a big change until 1970s when we have Newton Hawker Centres, the sort of first uh, post-independence uh, Hawker Center. So there are some very uh, significant uh, places like Chom Chom would be sort of one of the first to be built in a private estate. Uh, you know, East Coast Lagoon, you, you have uh, one that's really catered to, you know, the, the kind of uh, the beach setting. So if you if we are if you are very serious, I think we can also sort of uh, select certain uh, food centers so that we can also sort of uh, see how they have function. You know, one of the slides I show was about uh, Taman Sarasi, which was next to the Botanic Gardens. I think uh, it's, it's a shame because it's a very early example and it was also uh, probably built by URA. I think a lot of people won't know that there were sort of multiple agencies that built the Hawker Centers and not just, uh, you know, NEA or, or PWD. So URA built it because, uh, you know, the Botanic Gardens was a tourist location. Uh, and uh, a lot of uh, hawkers would actually, you know, throng outside the uh, site. So if we are very careful, I think we can be very selective. You know, one maybe a few from different phases. You know, some in the housing estates and so on and so forth, to continue this heritage. Of course, it will still have to sort of uh, satisfy the functions, right, uh, in providing uh, a well ventilated, you know, a, a conducive space for 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 eating and interaction. Yep, thank you, Chiken. Uh, Chiken, could I ask you a follow-up question um, on, regarding the COVID impact? Because I think you said that um, there's still food and people can still go there and buy uh, to fulfill that need, right, to buy the food. But whether there is some aspect of uh, social life or cultural life or uh, community life that's lost because we're not able to sit there. Sorry, uh, there and, uh, uh, sorry uh, do you hear me? Do, does everyone hear me? Am um, I lost? Can you repeat it again? Uh, no, uh, Chi Tian, I was asking about um, the loss of uh, communi community and communal life uh, in a hawker centre during COVID era. We can still buy our food, but in a way, uh, community life is not uh, really active. The cultural aspect, the cultural life of a hawker centre is not uh, there anymore while nobody's sitting and dining there. Could you maybe comment a little on that? I guess I'm yes, hoping. This is the uh, part four and yeah, this this wasn't what the uh, Hawker Center was built for because you could sit right next to different people, mm -hmm. right? Uh, even though you have uh, mm -hmm. choked your, your seats. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that sense of community is, is, is never quite the same, but that is uh, similar to many other public spaces as well, right? I mean, uh, so it's it's a, it's quite unfortunate that uh, mm -hmm. you know there's a sort of restrictions, but these are not the same as the enclosed areas like theaters and cinemas, who has had to sort of uh, you know cut 
uh, interaction, you know, at least by half. So I, mm -hmm. I would say that it's a, it's a great shame that the, you know, the community is not there because uh, that's really uh, designed, you know, a place for communication, a place for interaction. Uh, so it's, it's, it's rather unfortunate and hopefully, you know, um, you know, we can we can have this phase over uh, so that, you know, that that serves a, 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 a it it's, uh, goes back to its own old functions again. Yep, thank you. Thanks, Chiken. And the things that all um, mindful of time uh, and the things that I, I do, this is such an interesting uh, topic um, and the things that you know, all our speakers are coming in from very, very different angles, from history, heritage, social behaviors, you know, from technology um, and from sustainability point of view um, and the things that you know from lifestyle and from uh, entertainment point of view. So the things that you know, thank you all. You know, um, thank you, Ronald. You know, for hosting this event. You know, thank you to uh, Kenneth, Jason, and Chikian for this amazing sh sharing session. Yeah, um, and the things that um, we're just closing this event. Uh, and special thanks, you know, to the again special thanks to Singapore Heritage Board, URA, um, and RIB International. Yeah, and Singapore chapter, and of course, you know, to you the audiences, you know, for all your support. Yeah, thank you. And we look forward to seeing you all at the thank next REB event. Yeah, and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.